You are not alone. It's a sentence you've probably heard a million times over, but Jamie Tarkowski knows just how true those words are. He spent the last 15 years reading and hearing the stories of people across the world who've struggled with their mental health as the founder of Nonprofit to Write Love on Her Arms. His organization has raised over $2 million for treatment and recovery and is dedicated to connecting people with mental health resources and bringing them hope. I talked with Jamie about why we should have hope right now and how you can find it. This is our conversation. I think it's really easy because we all are all isolated right now. So we're feeling things in separate places physically. It's easy to feel like we're the only ones carrying what we're carrying. But I feel like of anyone with all of the stories you hear, you can kind of speak to just how not alone we are right now. Can you talk about that a little bit? I think with mental health, if, if someone's dealing with depression, often they feel alone. They feel isolated They they and they want to kind of hide out. And I think the silver lining to the pandemic is that we realize that everyone all over the world is having a challenging year, maybe the most unusual challenging year of our lives, no matter how old you are. And, and so I think there's a, there is a bit of a feeling of, hey, we're, we're in it together. And, and not only that, but just the idea that other people are struggling as well. Other people have had to make major adjustments and compromises and so I think it pushes back at that idea that, oh, I'm the only one who feels this way. Because whether someone's dealing with a mental health issue or not, we're all dealing with our world, you know, our lives looking radically different than they did a year ago. Mm -hmm. And I guess the hope is that that's a starting point to be honest, because anyone you interact with, you can talk about those challenges. You can talk, hopefully there's, it invites vulnerability. It invites you to say, man, how are you doing? What a year. What do things look like for you? And and no one has to fake it or pretend that everything's fine. And I've noticed a lot in your writing and your speaking, how you always turn things back to hope. Have you ever gone through periods, whether now or at another point where you struggled with the feeling of hopelessness? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I'm someone who struggles with depression and there's a little bit of irony to my life or my work because I don't even think my friends would describe me as super hopeful. <laughs> so there's sort of, I, I think a lot of times I'm communicating or sharing out of my own need. Like I'm saying things that I want and need to be true, you know? So I'm, I'm as someone who struggles and someone who's pretty sensitive and aware of struggle, I think it surprises people where they just think like, oh, Jamie pops out of bed and he's just hopeful and he has so much hope to give. But I think a lot of times it 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 comes from a just being in touch with my own need and and maybe being sensitive or hopefully empathetic to the needs of other people. Yeah, I totally get that. I always describe myself as an internal optimist for everyone else. Yeah. <laughs> for myself, I need the reminder. Um, where do you turn when you are feel, feeling hopeless? Where like the places you go or the resources you go to? I go to counseling every week. I'm really thankful for that. I mean, I always put that at the top of the list. Um, I've been on an antidepressant for several years now, a, bu a bunch of years, honestly. Um, so those are two things that relate to professional help. I have a little dog who's next to me, who's being really good right now, but um, this little nine pound best friend that's with me all the time. My, I'm close to my family. I live close to my family, but uh, we're, we're, I think, really closely connected, you know, relationally. I have two nephews that I love. I recently moved back to Florida and a big part of that was to be able to surf. Surfing feels really healthy and kind of reminds me who I am and it's something that I love. So I think it's a mix of professional help, um, close friends, family, and then just tapping back into things that I love, which I think is especially important this year when a lot of things look different and, and maybe we don't have access to all the good things or even fun things we used to do. So I think trying to find those outlets or those hobbies or, or things, even if it's as simple as, you know, taking a walk in the evening with my dog, um, trying to lean into the, the good stuff that we still have that, and you could also kind of call a lot of that self-care. I know that a lot of people are really skeptical about therapy. It sounds great in theory, but they're kind of scared to admit that they do need help or to ask for it or to know where to seek it. What would you recommend to someone who has kind of had a fear of seeking help in the past? I think speaking from my own experience and also speaking on behalf of 
at this point, thousands of people that we've heard from and, and connected with, I would say that it works and that it has been so beneficial and, and helpful in my life. And I think like a lot of things, it, we might be afraid of it when we've never experienced it. And it might be really scary to make that first appointment or to walk into that office or even take that first phone call. But my experience has been that it's worth it, that it's not easy, but it's worth it. And that you will find, or you can find a sense of healing and progress. And for me, it's also just, it's a way to kind of practice being honest for an hour a week to, to have a place to be vulnerable and to talk about the hardest things in my life. And I use some simple examples. It's like, if the check engine light comes on in your car, there's no shame in taking your car to a mechanic because they know how to fix cars. And you know, if you sprain your ankle or if you break a bone, you're going to go to a doctor because they know how to how to fix bones. They know how bodies are supposed to look and work and how healing happens. And, and I think our mental health shouldn't be any different. I want to pull it up because you have that great quote in the original story from Don Miller, where we're called to hold our hands against the wounds of a broken world to stop the bleeding. What do you think that looks like in the context of 2020? I, th I think I'm trying to wrestle with what does compassion look like? And, you know, maybe 10 years ago, I was really comfortable thinking and talking about mental health. But today I think about, I guess, what you would describe as intersections. You know, how does immigration, how does the refugee crisis intersect with mental health? How does gun violence, um, you know, e equal rights, uh, the LGBTQ community, just all, the, the reality that mental health is connected to so many other aspects of life. And I, I've kind of come back to this idea that caring about people has to mean caring about things that affect people. And so I, I think a lot about that, like what does it mean to show up and, and respond to, to people's pain? And it, it might, sometimes it's as simple as, or, or maybe a starting point is like learning about it talking about it, whether that's online or, or with the people that we're connected to, obviously being reminded that our vote counts. Um, you know, I think we, obviously we just experienced an election and, and saw so many people show up even in the midst of a pandemic, which I think is awesome. Um, but I think just, yeah, just, just uh, being willing to leave my comfort zone. And so to not just pick and choose the, the kinds of pain that I'm comfortable with or the kinds of pain that's not controversial um, but but really, I think being willing to wrestle with what what hurts people, what causes pain and suffering to people, maybe especially people whose lives and backgrounds look different from my own and not shying away from that. Yeah, that's really good. What does it look like right now to be present for you? Good question. Um, I think there's a I mean, there's a mix because I think as you ask that, I can think about being present in my own life. And that's probably the biggest one, but then also uh, what does it look like to be present with and for other people? And I think most of my days, it's just me and my dog. Um, so it's a lot of learning how to be present with myself, but then even like what you and I are doing to, to hopefully believe that this is necessary, that we would you know connect and communicate with people we love. Um, I think one cool thing about this year is I sort of joke that it's taken away FOMO because that, that like so many things have been canceled, you know, and, and there aren't these epic events happening in other places, or at least there shouldn't be. And I think that's been really helpful in terms of, I think, helping me be present is I used to always be getting on a plane like every week or two for an event or, or for whatever reason. And now I'm not. And, I think that's that's really helped me be present being back in Florida and and um, not always thinking I'm missing out or wondering what's happening elsewhere. Um, I think it's helped me slow down and, and just even having these simple rhythms like I, I go to Starbucks every morning and I read about basketball and I walk my dog every evening, you know, just like try to catch the sunset. So just I think having these these simple rhythms in my day to day life that are not super exciting or impressive, but they feel healthy and they've become things that I really look forward to. And then I think just, just wrestling with what does it mean to be present with other people? Like, what does it mean to be a good friend? And 
to not be distracted and, and whether it's in person or FaceTime or a phone call, just, just really trying to care for the people I claim to care about. Your story has had so many twists and turns. I know you didn't expect to be running a nonprofit originally, um, but it seems like from that, you kind of have this sense of trust that life works out the way it's supposed to. Do you believe that? It's, that's a tricky question to answer. Um, I, I'm kind of tempted to say no. I, I, don't, I, I, I don't think life always works out. I believe in hope. I read recently that hope is a commitment to the future. And I really like that, that hope is not just a feeling, but hope is a commitment to the future. But I think I, I, it can be a slap in the face like to a, to a mother who lost her son to suicide or lost her daughter to an overdose. It's not helpful to say everything works out, you know? There's just, there's so many awful things that make no sense and that happen, um, you know, whether it's radical things that happen in other parts of the world, you know, people dealing with violence and poverty and war, or it's a, it's a random car accident here in America. Um, there's so much that doesn't make sense. And so I don't, I try to be careful with blanket statements that might feel good or sound good, but, but also just not be helpful. So I, I like the idea of a commitment to the future, that for as long as I'm here and I'm breathing, um, I want to believe that good things are possible and, and ultimately that life is worth living. But I also want to acknowledge that, that so many things are unfair and, and so many things don't make sense. And uh, I guess we live in that tension. You know, we, we live in in the midst of both. The idea that life can be beautiful and it can be good and it can be so painful and filled with loss and, and there's so much, you know, it's, it's like the, we've heard the words forever, but just the idea that uh, bad things happen to good people. And sometimes good things happen to bad people and it doesn't make sense. So yeah, I, I really, I forget, I need to, I keep quoting it, so I need to figure out where it came from, but I, I just stumbled upon it in an article, but I, I had never heard it said that way, but the idea that hope is a commitment to the future, I, I really like that. Yeah, I love that definition. I've never heard it put that way before. Um, if someone were to ask you, why should I still have hope right now, what would you say? Uh, so many reasons. Some of them are a bit universal, and I think some of them we get to make our own list. But I think that we're all made to be known and loved. We, we get to be in relationships with other people, even in the midst of a pandemic, that's still true and that's still possible. And then I think we all get to figure out what are my individual reasons to stay alive? You know, what are the things that I love? What are the hobbies, the activities, the dreams that I have? Uh, maybe it's being in love, maybe it's having a family, maybe it's a career, maybe it's a place you want to live or a place you want to visit. I think hope can take so many different shapes and forms. Um, but I still come back to that. I the, Those sort of initial ones that are hopefully true for all of us, just the idea that what a cool thing that we get to breathe air and be connected to other people. We get to experience beauty and wonder and so many good things and I talk a lot or I think a lot about surprises how if I leave this life too early I'm going to miss out on so many good surprises and when it comes to a lot of the best things I've ever experienced they came as surprises like when I each time I fell in love I didn't orchestrate that it didn't come from a whiteboard or a five-year plan it's like I was at a concert and I met someone and and it came as a surprise. And, and so I think in encouraging people to stay for those surprises, like those moments that make life worth living and those moments when our life can really change in a, in a positive way. And so I, I try to encourage people that it's worth it to, to stick around for those things. <sighs> wow, that conversation was so powerful for me. I think one of my favorite takeaways was you have to stay around for the surprises in life. It reminds me of one of my favorite sayings, anything can happen anytime. It's worth sticking around to find out what does. 
Let me know your takeaways on social media at Megan Lynn TV. And if you or someone you know needs mental health resources or treatment, you can go to To Write Love and Her Arms website at twloha.com slash find help. If this episode helped you, make sure to subscribe because I'm going to have Jamie back in a few weeks to talk about how we can show up as better friends. Until next time, remember you're loved, you matter, and you've got this.